have, we have reached our final presentation, the panel discussion, why collect medals? So I'll call John Adams, our moderator, Dave Bowers, Rob Rodriguez, John Sally, and Stephen Schur to the table. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, you all are entitled to congratulations for your endurance. I mean, this has been a spectacularly long day. Granted that the, the material that's been covered has been spectacularly interesting. Nonetheless, uh, uh, your endurance is a great credit to you, and I, I, I implore you to just one more hour and we'll get it all done. And, and this hour should be uh, immensely rewarding because the subject why collect is certainly a pithy one. All of us have thought about it from time to time. And on my left, your panel are uh, four of the great collectors uh, of all time. And each in turn is going to reveal their innermost secrets about why they collect. Um, and I'd like to begin with Steve Schur, if I may. Steve. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And, and I really delighted myself to be here. Uh, this is a fantastic organization. It was my first introduction to MHS, but the MCA has grown from uh, a small child to a very mature adult and is growing uh, fantastically. Why collect medals? I think the same question can be asked, why collect anything? Um, what is the motivation? Uh, I'm an art historian, and my subject was always. Uh, oh, should I do the? We need the. We need the slide. Oh, the clicker remote. I can do this. Maybe. Which one? Forward there. Zero. Oh. Get it. Here, let me tee you up while you talk. Okay. And my area of specialization uh, as an academic and art historian is actually later medieval sculpture and early Netherlandish painting and some Italian Renaissance areas. So why did I start collecting medals? When I was an undergraduate, uh, I read Jakob Burkhardt's famous uh, study of the Renaissance, the civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, which was published in 1860. It was a sort of seminal work about the Italian Renaissance. And I was fascinated by his description of that period, and particularly about the people who he talked about. So uh, during one summer, I was traveling in Italy and was found myself in Florence. And I was walking along the Arno, and I saw an art dealer. Uh, well, I think that being a collector is something you're perhaps born with. I often think of it, and I think it's sometimes described as being a disease. But it's a disease which um, none of us really want to be cured of. Um, and uh, so I made my way to the dealer's uh, location. And I walked in, and I was just this grubby little student. And I asked him, and he was very welcoming, which was uh, at least a, a good way to start. And I asked him what he had in the way of works of art. And he brought out a few things. I remember one of them was a uh, Baroque pearl that is mounted, was mounted as jewelry in the Renaissance, many of which exist as forgeries. But then he handed me a medal. And I'm pretty sure it was the medal of Silicimano Malatesta by Matteo de Pasti. And when he passed it to me, it was like an electric shock. I mean, it was, it was, there was suddenly a kind of spiritual bridge that had been built between me and that period. Because these people had existed on pages of a book. And um, that is one way of describing a person. And in fact, in the Renaissance, in which um, more realistic portraiture was developed, both in the North, in Netherlandish painting, and in Italy, um, there was a kind of paragone between, well, there's several paragones, one between painting and sculpture, and one between, um, it, it was the beginnings of detailed biographies. 
It was also, which is one of the things that um, Burkhardt made a point of, uh, a new kind of uh, individual secular individuality, a, 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 an emphasis on the um, on personal existence, personal accomplishments, personal beliefs, and therefore biography. And this was really, in a way, simplifying things maybe overly, it was in a way a contrast to the Middle Ages in which one's aspirations were beyond this world, were beyond uh, temporal existence and more toward a spiritual world, toward salvation. Um, which did not really, in a way, foster biography or portraiture until quite late in the Middle Ages. Uh, therefore, there was a kind, uh, the one paragony that, that I'm referring to is between written biography, in which you can go into great detail, and you can have an illustration or something, and the uh, portrayal of the individual, in which you actually see the physical features. Uh, a painted portrait was this, an individual commission and usually had a very limited circulation, if any circulation at all. Whereas the medal, and this is the reason for the, uh, the invention of the medal, was something that could be reproduced. It was, uh, it was um, indestructible, virtually, and it could be um, circulated it was a way of distributing this um, particular distinct individual. So I'm holding this medal, and here is this Renaissance <coughs> prince, proud, um, and with a lot of information about him, not as much as in a, in a, a written biography, but still, it, it gave his title. And there were many painted portraits, which we have, uh, that do not have any inscription. You don't know who it is. So if there was a, um, a desire for immortality, both temporal and beyond, uh, a temporal ident identification and, and immortality, the painting didn't achieve that, but the medal did. So I knew this was Sigismund Mundo Malatesta. I had read about him. And here it gives me even more information because there's a reverse. And on that reverse is his castle. He's telling us all about himself as a ruler, as a protector of his people, as a condottieri, that is a mercenary soldier. And uh, I was hooked. So uh, as a poor student, I couldn't buy the medal. I didn't buy the medal. I did eventually, that's one of my medals. Uh, but any museum in Italy that I visited thereafter I, um, I was made a point of, of seeing the medal collection. Well, it was a long time before I ever acquired a medal, but um, as a student of sculpture, my, my desire was to own it as sculpture. I mean, I knew very well about its numismatic sources. I had been an ANS a summer seminar student when I was a graduate student at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, and I had done my ANS paper on portraiture on Italian Renaissance coins, which actually doesn't occur until many years after the first medals appear in Italy around 1438. Um, so I was not able, going back, I was not able to purchase this medal or anything for quite some time. Then as a student at the Institute, there was a, um, I, I should be careful of time. Careful time, yes. Yeah, okay, I'll skip that part. Um, <laughs> it gets complicated. Uh, we could listen all afternoon. No, that's okay. Uh, I, guess, uh, I guess once I had, so once I decided that this was an object which was very inspirational, uh, that became one of the bases for my collecting, is the evocative nature of this object. Uh, the fact that it had transported me historically. Uh, but then I had to sort of set up standards, and um, because as a reproducible object, it would be encountered in many different forms, as it, most of the early metals, or almost all of the early metals until the 16th century were cast. So the process of casting, 
is something that can result in many different levels of quality and in a reproducibility, which in one way was, was a benefit to those who were distributing metals, but to those who were collecting metals, uh, it could be a danger. So my criterion, my major criterion, was the quality, uh, two, two aspects of quality. One, the quality of the actual work of art itself, because I was considering it as a work of art, a work of sculpture. What was the quality of the design? What, was the, what, was the, what, what had the artist produced? And had it produ been produced at a level of quality that touched me? Um, and the other um, was then the particular example. Did it meet, uh, because one can compare examples, did it meet the level of quality that I kind of had to guess or assume from comparative work uh, was what the artist wanted, to, wanted me to see. Because as you go through various casts, you begin to lose quality. And so those are the two major criteria. And then I just, I just, just got going. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve, as I was putting together this panel, uh, uh, I was uh, <coughs> counting on him to uh, let you in a bit on the aesthetic uh, dimension of metal collecting, and as you can tell from this lovely portrait metal on the on the screen, uh, he is a man of great taste. I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, go ahead. You talk, and I'll, I'll just go through a few of these. Our our our, our next panelist is uh, 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 a great analyst, uh, a great studier of detail. Uh, indeed, he reminds me of Sherlock Holmes because after a long career of doing what he did, he ends up being a beekeeper. Uh, John Sally, when he isn't keeping bees and drawing off honey, uh, uh, monitors a collection of school medals that is mind-boggling in terms of its scope. Uh, why he ever started doing those and continuing as long as he did, we're about to hear right now. So tell us, John. Thank, thanks very much. And before, uh, before I get into this, um, I have to put in a plug. I've been asked two or three times, how do I join the Metal Collectors of America? And uh, the, the easiest way is just to go to the website, metalcollectors.org, metalcollectors.org and there's a tab that says join or membership or something like that. And you can go on there and even pay by PayPal. So if you have a, and it's, and it's um, mobile friendly. So if you have your iPhone right now as I speak, you can join the MCA. Um, the other question that I've been asked is uh, that Hephaestus medal, that beautiful Hephaestus medal, how do I get one of those? And the, the easiest way for that, sorry, the easiest way for that is uh, Neil Masani, who's sitting in the last row, uh, raising his hand, has a few of them, and you can, you, can buy, you can buy one, and if he runs out, he'll be able to tell you where to get another one. So metalcollectors.org, if you're not already a member, join the MCA. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk, I mean, you know, the question is, why collect metals? And you can ask it three different ways, or two different ways, even before you get to why do you collect school metals, which is first, why collect metals? Um, many of us here collect metals, uh, and I think when he came up with the question, John assumed that we're all collectors, of course, uh, why collect metals as opposed to coins or tokens or paper money or beanie babies or whatever. Uh, but I think you have to actually step back and say, why, why collect metals? Ann Bentley doesn't collect metals, and yet she's one of our officers and one of the organizers, and, and there are others <coughs> here who don't collect for one reason or another. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, many of us would say, well, we collect because uh, we're intellectually curious, uh, we value the tangible co connection of the past, we appreciate the beauty, the artistry, the craftsmanship, and so on. Um, I, I actually dug into this a little bit um, for a set of articles I wrote a couple of years ago for the MCA advisory on the evolution of metal collecting. and you know, looked into what psychologists and social scientists said, and, and they would not disagree that, that the art, the memory, uh, the tangible co connection, the personal connect connection to the past uh, is important, but um, 
you know, Freud, Sigmund Freud actually thought that it had to do with uh, this, a strong collecting instinct grew out of an individual's effort to compensate for a loveless childhood. Um, <laughs> Carl, Carl Jung, you know, this is, this is somewhat less laughable. Carl Jung thought it was evolutionary, um, that it was really a basic human instinct taken to extreme, that our hunter-gatherer ancestors evolved to hoard valuable resources that would help them survive. And as a species, we have a deeply ingrained need to collect things that we might find useful in the future, and that we modern collectors have just taken this instinct sort of to its illogical extreme. Um, more recently, um, more recently, and you know, there are books, they're, they've had conferences on this, I guarantee you, you know, books, conferences, journal articles, and so on, point to two things above and beyond this uh, intellectual curiosity and, and uh, love of art. Uh, one is, um, you know, a need to develop a sense of achievement and enhance one's self-image, and the second is social status, a feeling of competence. And if any of you collectors are out there who don't take some pride in owning something that no one else has, that you have the best example of, you got a great deal on, or that you have the biggest collection of, I dare you to stand up right now, okay? So I, I think you understand what I'm saying. There is this dimension of it. Um, but, and I'm gonna skip over the why collect medals. I think other people on the panel will talk about that. But let me tell you a little bit about why I collect school medals and why those are intriguing to me. Um, and, and I think important in a way that, you know, I'm one of the few people who understand. Uh, this is the first school medal I bought. Uh, it's a Boston school medal, appropriately. Uh, it's personally interesting because I met Ann Bentley in researching it in, you know, when I was a student at MIT in the mid to late 70s. Uh, when I was a kid, I collected uh, coins, like probably many of you did. I had my Whitman albums, I had my Red Book. Uh, I gravitated, you know, once I sort of got beyond putting pennies in, you know, the holes, uh, gravitated to type coins. Uh, one of my best coins was a 20 cent, an 1877 20 cent piece, proof 20 cent piece that I bought from Hathaway and Bowers Galleries. Uh, it, today it would be, you know, MS67 in a slab. Back then it was just a nice clean proof coin that I got from Dave Bowers uh, <coughs> way back when. Um, but you know, when I went to college. Money, money uh, back guarantee. Yeah, right, yeah, right. <laughs> For the same price back then, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when I went to college, I couldn't afford any of this stuff anymore. I, you know, I could barely afford my tuition. So, uh, but I still, you know, being having the collecting instinct, I went to um, the coin shows, the Ed Alio coin show, which was then back then at the Hojo '57. Um, I went to the, um, you know, the coin dealers on Bromfield Street. There were a couple of them in the Back Bay, and I saw in their cases things that were you know, t t tokens, medals, uh, that were at least as intriguing to me as some of the coins that I had in my collection at a tiny fraction of the cost. Um, and if I asked questions about them, nobody, none of those guys knew anything about most of them. Uh, this medal uh, I bought, I didn't know what it was when I bought it, I bought it for $2 out of a coin dealer's junk box. And as I started, you know, riding my bike around Boston trying to figure out what this thing was, it turned out it's a Boston School Medal. These medals were endowed by Benjamin Franklin um, when he, in his will, because even though we associate him with Philadelphia, he was born and educated his couple of years of school in Boston. And, uh, and the, the old-timey dealers, um, you know, on Bromfield Street and so on, had batches of these that they had sort of accumulated over the years and nobody else knew what they were or wanted them. And I ended up researching them. I wrote an article for the Numismatist that was published in 1978 and I won a Heath Literary Award as a kid. Um, and so I was kind of hooked on it. I went around and, and I went to Ralph Goldstone, if you remember him, you know, and he had a batch of them. So I bought all of those. And then uh, Martin Deeren and, and Bill Tibbetts had all of the ones that Malcolm Chelfrost had bought in the decades that he was a uh, dealer uh, in Boston. And then somebody said, you ought to talk to Alan Weinberg. Um, at, you know, Alan just bought Maury Gould's accumulation of them. And so I bought this like box of medals that came actually 
uh, and ironically with a bunch of hand engraved early Boston medals that I didn't want, but they came with this thing. In fact, it's sort of ironic because um, I've now, at this point, gathered up all the Boston school medals that probably were ever around and, uh, and had certainly the biggest collection of them, far bigger than the number that the Mass Historical Society has. Uh, and I had all these, these engraved ones that I didn't really care about. So um, Jim Scalby had just opened a, a shop, a high-end shop on Boylston Street, right near Copley, Copley uh, Square. And he was looking for stuff to fill up his cases. He said, yeah, if you want, I'll put them in my case and see if anybody buys them. So I put them in there at $15 a piece. And I didn't sell one, not one. And so after a while, I took them back out. And I said, well, I guess I'm collecting those too. Ironically, it turns out those are the really interesting ones. Um, you know, and, and from there, I got to you know, other American medals, British medals, German medals. You know, it's been 40 years now, and I had a lot of them. Um, and someday, hopefully, I'll get to you know the book or the books. Um, but as I thought about like why do I collect those and why which are the ones that I like the best? Which are the two or three that I would want to tell somebody about that really excite me? I, I think what the theme is, and this is the first one, is yes, it's about the art, and yes, it's about the history, and indeed the personal history, which is. Um, you know, for those of you who are historians, you know, there's been a trend over the last few decades away from studying wars and great white dead men and, um, you know, relationships between nation states and towards the common people, uh, you know, how they live their lives and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, these school medals are mostly kind of folky art. Some of them are better art, but they're mostly folky art. Um, but it's not really the art, and it's not even really the personal history, but to me it's the philosophy, it's the value that they convey. This medal is um, from the, eight, it's dated 1855. It was awarded by the New, York, um, the New York Society for the Promotion of Education Among Colored Children. So think about that. This is, uh, you know, eight years before the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, Afri African Americans had been emancipated in New York, I think, in the 1820s. But even then, you know, there, this was still not a fully integrated society. And yet, there were there was a, a group of very progressive citizens um, who thought it was important that these Afri African American kids had the same opportunities and the same even the same school medals that their white, uh, uh, you know, elite. Um, you know, high class uh, counterparts uh, had as well. And, and so here's a medal that's at least as good as anything else that was, um, you know, made in New York in, in that period or probably decades before or after. Um, you know, you may look at it and say, it's, well, it's not really high art, like belongs in the MFA, but it's really, you know, I like the engraving and it's, and the thing about it though that's really interesting is look, it says knowledge is power. And think about that. If you're a black kid, you know, an African American kid at that time, and you don't know what society's all about, you're trying to figure out, like, how, how do I have a happy life? How do I be a productive citizen? You know, and somebody says to you, look, you know, it's about education, it's about knowledge is power. That message being conveyed from those adults, those progressive citizens, to that, to that child is a very, very important message. So that's, that's one example of this. Um, here's another one, and this is also a demonstration that not all good medals are early American medals. This is actually an early Australian medal, and it's large. It's got everything. It's got everything going for it. You know, it's sort of like it's basically from an Australian perspective the equivalent of the large George Washington hand engraved Indian peace medals, only if they had been engraved by Paul Revere. Um, it, it really, I mean, there are about six or seven of these known. Whenever they come onto the market, at least in Australia, they make a big splash. Half of them are in institutions. Um, I, I happen to have one. Um, it, it's really a neat metal, but again, it, above and beyond the art, the allegory, the <coughs> tie to the Australian history, um, there's this value that's here, uh, which means um, let me read it so I don't mess it up too badly. Um, it's basically 
and I won't butcher the Latin either, at, way, at first the way is hard, but labor, labor itself becomes a pleasure. So think about teachers, you know, for them, it was not just about teaching and about, um, uh, you know, giving awards to the students who, who excelled, but for them, every opportunity was a teachable moment, and this is an object lesson uh, to those kids. And um, this, the, there's, um, we, we're, you know, short on time, so I'm not going to go into the engraver who signed this was a banknote forger who was transported to Australia. The, um, the schoolmaster who gave it, uh, you couldn't invent his life. I mean, you couldn't just like, a novelist could not invent his life. Among other things, um, he's, he was on the HMS Britannia at the Battle of Trafalgar as a, a chaplain. He wasn't actually an ordained minister, and many years later, Parliament had to pass a special uh, act just to solemnize all the, man, all the um, marriages he performed in his <laughs> career as a fake <coughs> chaplain. Uh, so that's, that's one, and actually, that's not why he was transported to Australia. He was transported to Australia because he was also a forger of banknotes. Um, and the kid was just a kid who happened to be in Australia because his father was in Australia. His father was this really famous murderer. And again, if anybody's interested, I'll tell you that whole story, but it's, it's actually a very famous story. Um, but this is the last medal, and this I don't think you would say is high art um, by any stretch of the imagination. It's from the Altdorf Academy, which is outside of Nuremberg, or was outside of Nuremberg. Uh, and they issued uh, school award medals. It's really, you know, you could just as the, as the Franklin Boston School medals were the um, progenitors, the, the, um, the, exam the, the um, principal, uh, um, you know, root of many school award medals in America, this set of medals, there are actually 190 different medals that were given between 1577 and 1626 at this one academy were effectively the progenitors of all school medals. So in that sense, they're very interesting to me. But each one of them is different. And this one, and so I'm not gonna show you all 190 of them. Uh, the only collection of those is in the German National <coughs> Museum in Nuremberg. But um, they all have this object lesson, this philosophy that, that the schoolmasters there were trying to convey to the kids. In this particular case, um, this is Croesus, you know Croesus, Rich's Croesus, the, um, uh, the author of the first gold standardized coins, that's him. And right next to him is Cyrus, about ready to light this uh, pyre on fire to kill him or burn him alive. And the story that goes with this is that Croesus, early in his tenure as king of Lydia, uh, asked uh, Solon, philosopher Solon, who is the um, who is the most happy man alive? And of course, he expected Solon to say, "Well, you are, of course, Croesus. You're the most, you're the most uh, wealthy man alive. You must be the most happy man alive." And uh, Solon, at first, he was like, "I don't think I really want to get into this discussion with this guy." But he basically said that no, he could think of. You know, he didn't want to really address, you know, Croesus's happiness, but he could think of three people who were more happy: Tellus, who died fighting for his country and the brothers Cleobus and Biton, who died peacefully because of their filial uh, piety, died in their sleep at the, because of their mother's prayer. She was so touched by their filial piety. And, um, and Solon, in effect, observed that uh, because of the fickleness of fate, the happiness of a man's life cannot be judged until after his death. You can't really tell you know, if a man is happy and, and you know, reached his full potential. It up. Okay, and um, and so the point is that uh, this this um, uh, legend, Antiobitum Nemo, is a shortened version of um, part of Ovid's Metamorphoses, which is basically that no one should be co called happy before his death. And again, it's not the art; it's not really the history. This isn't historically important, but it's the philosophy uh, and the values that go along with these medals that I that I find personally very intriguing. Fabulous job, John. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Rod Rodriguez. Uh, Rod collected coins as a young man and uh, then decided, I guess, he had to go to work. And did he ever go to work? He rose to the absolute top of his profession 
and uh, uh, very well known for what he did. And uh, fortunately for us, he retired um, just a couple of years ago and decided to go back to his first love of coin collecting. And he has put into it the energy of a whirling dervish. I have no idea what he's going to talk about now. I'm not sure he did before he got up there, but I know for sure it will be interesting. Rod, your ball. Well, thank you very much. This is my first time to be back here. Uh, I only returned to the collecting field back in early 2014 after a 53-year absence. And I returned with the idea that I was going to collect coins, and primarily early federal coinage and gold. So that's where I was starting. And in my second auction, uh, while I was preparing uh, to look at some coins, I ran across something I'd never seen before because metals were foreign to me. In fact, this question had never even uh, crossed my consciousness uh, when I returned. And so I see this Libertas Americana uh, up for auction, and I'm just absolutely stunned by it. I'm looking at it, and the more I read about it, the history and what it means and all, it touched me in a way that I had never been hit before. And so I said, well, I've got I've to go for it. And when I held it uh, in lot viewing the very first time, uh, they had to almost pull it away from me. I, I said, I can't let this thing go. And so I didn't, but I thought this was a one-off experience because I'm a hardcore coin collector, and so I just said, it's just a one-off. Uh, then I'm preparing for uh, an auction that I don't think you know anything about. It was the Pogue auctions. I've heard of that. Yeah, I, I thought you might, you know, but, you know, age. And so I'm preparing for the Pogue auction, and I'm going through the catalog, and they have the auction for the following day, and buried in that catalog is this little item. Again, it's another one that I'm totally unfamiliar with. I'm starting to read about it, and the more I start reading about it, it hits me in a way very much like the Libertas did. It just gave me a deeper meaning, appreciation, and all. And then when I held it, I said, okay, I've got to do some heavy research on this. So I went through auction catalogs, uh, went through the American Journal of Numismatics, uh, and then reading. One book I didn't go through because it was on order, but I hadn't received it. It was by a gentleman here who's published on metals. I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, I decided I was going to pen a piece for the e asylum about why I thought I had a competitive advantage when I went after this medal. So I write this article, and shortly thereafter, I get this email from this person, a person by the name of John Adams. And shall we say he's taking a little bit of issue with my uh, work on that article. And so with that, we start a two-month exchange of emails and developed a friendship from that time on. And he says, Rob, come back to Boston. Come back to see the Massachusetts Historical Society and let me show you the Comitia Americana set of Washington. And so my wife and I came back here and we spent the day. Uh, another person who was gracious with her time was Anne. And we just had an absolute ball. And I have to tell you, with that, between the Libertas and the Diplomatic Medal, and coming back here, shall we say, th this added a new feature collect to collecting that I had never even thought of. Along the way, I ran across something like this. Uh, this is the Adam Eckfeld uh, Retirement Tribute Medal. And I looked at the collection a few years ago, but couldn't come to a, an agreement with the uh, representatives of it. So I just put it back in the uh, file and said, it's one of those that got away. Well then, last year, the collection came up for sale through Goldberg Auctions. Unlike the first time where I had less than, I would say, a week and a half to do my study, and all to come up with an idea of what I thought it might be worth. This time I had three years 
of more researching metals, history, and all. And now I had another person in my bullpen who knew more about it than I did, and that was John. And he was very much afraid that the collection would be acquired and broken up. So I told him, I said, don't worry about it, John. I'm going to get it, and it's not going to be broken up. So we got that, and here, I, I'll go back. On this medal here, some of you may not know, but there's a passing the hat document in the collection. And it raised $180 in 1839. Now, putting that in terms of today's purchasing power, assuming 4% or 5% compound uh, rates of growth, that would only work out to $193,000 to $1,064,000 today. So that is what I would call a pretty significant retirement medal. So as we went along, I said, that is really something else. And then the other medals in it were fantastic. I love the 60th anniversary uh, medal with the Flying Eagle. The uh, $10 1803 Gold Eagle. It's been in the family since 1807. So I have to think it's one of the longest provenance single family medals of anywhere in numismatic. What do you put a price on that? It's just, it's unbelievable. So as we were going through it, uh, I'll come up to this one here. It had a collection of documents. Now, one of the important documents was the uh, listing of the coining machinery that was taken from a Richard Harper. Now, most of the people who are analysts in this area, the first thing they do is they look at the coining machines and the inventory, because this is one of the earliest documents of coining machinery of the US Mint. Now, I have to point out that when I first looked at this collection, I didn't know who Adam Eckfeldt was, and I didn't know why he was important. But those were just side topics. While I was looking at this one here, I noticed uh, the paragraph and I broke it out on the right. And when I read that, it uh, had the terminology taken. And then it had, by order of the mayor of the city, the machines are taken. And it's by order. I don't know about you, but that struck me as that's legalese. And this is for August 29th, 1797. Therefore, I said, I wonder if I could find the court order in the Philadelphia records. So I ran through it, and I found the court order of August 28th, 1797. And uh, the order was given uh, for the simple reason uh, they wanted the uh, Maryland to return Richard Harper back to stand trial for a little thing called uh, passing base metal in the likeness of Spanish dollars and parts of it dollars. In other words, they wanted them back for counterfeiting. So I have the news articles from the period of time. On December 4th, 1797, he was convicted, five years in prison, $20. And the question I have is, is Richard Harper related to John Harper? who had the coining machines, the coin, the first coins of our country there. I said, I don't know. I've gotten everything up to the last check where they hand off to one another, and that's still to do. One of the side benefits of acquiring this collection was that I got to know the Eckfeldt family, uh, Uncle Johnny. Uh, Uncle Johnny is 76 years old. He's the keeper of the family lore. And I called him in Lima, Peru to ask him about, could he tell me anything about uh, Adam Eckfeldt's first wife? And he said, what first wife? I said, well, Maria Hahn. He says, no, we only know about Margarita Bausch of 1800. Maria Hahn and Adam Eckfeldt were married on April 3rd, 1792. And it relates to another project I'm doing. And oh, by the way, the US Mint Act was passed on April 2nd. So they got married the day after. Could there be something with that? So I bring this is that I started this area collecting, returning to coins without the slightest intent of metals. 
And as I got into this, I found that metals add texture, substance, a depth that I never realized. They add such perspective to a cl collection. And out of this, it's brought a new perspective of it. And it has been fun. And without doing this, I would never have had the opportunity to meet these wonderful people, as well as some other wonderful people in here. So I feel very fortunate. And with that, John. I think you can sense from the energy that our panelists exude that uh, uh, this is a hobby that suits them and uh, uh, they have a lot to uh, give back to us and uh, they're doing that as we speak. Uh, slight change in schedule here so you won't feel nervous about 15 minutes left and, and, and a whole pile of speakers to come. We're going to wind up this panel presentation uh, with a talk from uh, Q. David Bowers, uh, who obviously needs uh, no introduction, but um, I do think uh, he's picked an extraordinary subject to talk about, and I can't wait to hear uh, what you have noodled, David. So uh, uh, bring us home. Oh, here. How do I like metals? Well, we when I was a little kid, uh, at age 13, 14, I was, uh, discovered the world's greatest hobby. I still call it a hobby. And um, I didn't have much money, but I loved learning. I, uh, I liked writing. I was a, <coughs> I, our, in eighth grade, I was captain of the debate team in 44 High School, and we beat the seniors. And I gave a speech on George Washington's birthday. And I always liked writing. So when I discovered coins, I said, gosh, this is amazing. There's so many things to learn. How do I learn? So I belonged to the Wilkes-Barre Coin Club in Pennsylvania. And I said, I'd like numismatic books and literature. Well, uh, there was no market for numismatic books and literature at that time. Uh, George Fold traded in it, and Frank Caton did, but no one, the collectors didn't collect it. So people would say, well, here's my set of Max Mel, not set, here are all my Max Mel catalogs, here are my Stax catalogs, here are my, uh, uh, my uh, so-and-so catalogs. And I, so I started getting huge numbers of, and also books. And then I found that I used to go to, uh, make the rounds of dealers, and when dealers bought collections, they had to take books with them, but they didn't know what to do with them. So I started building a nice library, almost free of charge, uh, and I, then I started reading it, and I, I discovered a numismatic <coughs> scrapbook magazine, which I hope Leonard Augsburger will digitize, my favorite of all the old magazines as far as human interest. The American Journal of Numismatics, I had stray issues. I wrote to the ANS in New York City, uh, which I had joined later in 1958. And I said, do you have any copies of the American Journal of News? And oh, yes, we have some in the cellar. So they had these uh, bound copies by volume with, with uh, uh, brown paper around them and strings. And they were thinking, like, how about like $5 a volume? Well, that's just fine. And so I got a, a complete set of American Journal of Numismatics from the ANS uh, because they'd been there for years and no one looked at them. I started reading all these, and I started reading about metals, about co comets, and uh, if you read in the numismatists and during World War I, they, each issue had all the different metals being made in Europe, and, uh, but I didn't have any metals. Uh, I was, you know, earning my way through, through life, buying and selling coins and patterns that are my specialty in colonials. Then one day, when I was at Penn State in 1957, a guy named Al Julian uh, contacted Empire Coin Company, which I was a partner of, or maybe it was before Empire, and said, uh, would you be interested in a large collection of, of Washington medals? And I said, uh, yes, what are they? Well, no one really wants them, and the estate wants them, I think it was like a thousand dollars for them, and they're quite heavy in this big box. I said, where are they from? Well, they're from Mr. King, who was well known for writing a book on Lincoln medals, but he also collected Washington medals, but I don't know anything about them. Would you want them? And I said, okay. So I got them and went Penn State and opened this big box and there were Washington Seasons medals and American Beaver medals, <laughs> you name it, probably worth a million dollars today, but back then it was not. So then I had to study, I want to find out about Washington medals. So then I bought Wait Raymond's book, Early Washington Medals and read it, talked to John Ford who knew a lot about medals and got involved in it. Uh, then uh, go, fast forward a little bit later. Next one. 
No, I need the uh, uh, Columbia and Washington medal. That's it, right there. Oh. There it is. Yeah, we uh, so uh, fast forward a little bit. Uh, John Ford, uh, who is a very good friend of mine, I know he fell from grace later, and I'm sorry about that. I, I, I defended John up until it was impossible to defend him. But um, he said his favorite medal was the uh, Columbia and Washington medal, which you see here. Uh, and uh, he told me a story about Ted Craig, a friend of his who uh, bought one and then wanted to read about it. And there's a book by Mr. Howey, H-A-W-A-Y, over 500 pages in length that tells all about this medal. He read it and Ted Craig said, oh, that's just so wonderful. Uh, and, but then John Ford looked at his medal, it's not genuine and, and uh, so that was too bad. But John said it was his very favorite medal. Um, then uh, I said, well, why, how's one of this escaped me? I don't remember having read in depth about it. But then I looked in our catalog of the uh, Garrett collection, uh, and there is one there that uh, uh, John Adams uh, bought. And I said, John, I just uh, I went and bought the Howey book. I said, you couldn't go on the internet and buy books, but I read the whole thing. And I said, I just have to have one of these. I can't live without one of these. So John sold me the Garrett collection one. And then I came down to see Ann Bentley, and Ann Bentley said, this is her favorite medal. This is Ann's. Uh, this is Anne's medal in the, this is a Mass Historical Society medal. She is my very favorite medal. And so I went out and now I own the two of them. Uh, and uh, they're my favorite medals. They're quite expensive, uh, but uh, wonderful. And the story, of the, the story of this in brief is that um, these people listed on the medal uh, uh, decided to outfit an, a, a uh, expedition from Boston Harbor up to <coughs> what is now the state of uh, state of Washington, the unexplored Pacific Northwest, Pacific Northwest. And remember, this is years before Lewis and Clark. And uh, so they outfitted two ships, uh, the uh, Columbia and the Lady Washington. The Columbia was the larger of the two ships. They left uh, Boston and uh, uh, and seven, left Boston, I wrote that down here, on August, uh, no, on September 30, 1787, taking with them a supply of medals plus freshly coined uh, Massachusetts cents and half cents. Uh, well, I don't know what they were going to do with them, but they took them along. They, they thought that the dies were made by Mr. Callender, C A L L E N D E R, who was one of the engravers of the mass of coins. They went, the two ships uh, accompanied each other. The, the, uh, Columbia and her escort down to Cape Horn, and then they became separated. Uh, but then they reunited at Nootka up in Washington and met the, met the natives. These are pictures probably out of Hawaii. Uh, uh, I've collected uh, information on this. Uh, and the Columbia, the reason the Columbia River is named the Columbia River is because the ship Columbia leaving in Boston uh, was the first, per, first uh, Anglo people to see it, and they named the river after the ship. I don't know if the people know that over there, uh, uh, but that's very interesting. Came back, they came back in the 1790. Uh, I have never heard of any uh, half cents or, or, uh, or cents of, of Massachusetts being found in the Pacific Northwest. If the natives had them, what happened? But uh, anyway, uh, I was just thinking today, I did my, most of my research about 20, 25 years ago, and I've written about this medal. Uh, and today on the internet, I, I think when I go home and have some time, I'm going to look up the Boston newspapers to go to the American Antiquarian Society, which I'm a member of, and uh, just look through some of the newspaper accounts. You've probably already done this, Ann, to see, to see what, how they were sent off from Boston. Or you can send me your files and I won't go. Uh, Anne is by, wonderful, by the way, as, as has been said before. Uh, as far as uh, uh, then, I, then after doing the Washington medals I just mentioned, I uh, uh, bought, I ha acquired copies of the Louvat text, which is a beautiful t text. Most copies are rather ragged condition, and C. Willis <coughs> Beck's te text. So I decided to learn about C. Willis Beck's Betts, who you might know about as a teenager. He made uh, uh, so, uh, copies of U.S. coins, including the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Belgian me medal, which fooled uh, 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 who? Frossard, I forgot. Frossard, 
Breeding <coughs> Bears, where I own that now. Uh, so I had to learn all about uh, C. Willis Betts, and so I read all about him, much of the, who wrote the book. By the way, it hasn't been mentioned in the seminar yet, the one book that's, that's crying to be read or done is a new version of Betts. Uh, during uh, his lifetime, John Ford said he was going to do it, and, and John Adams would be a good person to do it. And, and, uh, you two would be very good to do it. Uh, John, John, John and, uh, and Anne have been co-authors. Uh, but uh, anyway, going from metal to metal, uh, I, uh, I, uh, the first coin to be in America was, was, uh, uh, was uh, John, a John Allen, Johannes Allen, born in uh, Scotland, but uh, by 1820 he was an accountant in New York City and he was offering coins for sale. So, and, and, uh, so I c came about finding that in 1820 there was a set of medals by Moody, M-U-D-I-E of England. Do you have a set of those? Okay. Uh, and there, there were, it's a set of English medals and there were only three sets sold in America. And John Moody, uh, excuse me, John Allen bought one. So of course I had to have a set of these medals. So uh, I got a set. Medals are very cheap. A set of medals probably cost $3,000, I don't remember, for 50 different medals all in proof in a case. And then I bought the Eliasberg, Rich, uh, Louis Eliasberg's collection of French. French medals are absolutely wonderful. You know, they come in sets and uh, uh, very highly, highly prized by uh, in a typical issue of French medals will have, and I'm making this up a little bit, 40 medals by six different French artists. Uh, you know, Barry, Roti, you name them. Uh, and uh, they're very collectible. So I just, I absolutely love medals. And uh, uh, whenever I uh, uh, have a collection, whenever you have a collection of them, I uh, uh, buy them occasionally. And uh, uh, I'm, right now I would, I'm a, I would be a very good candidate for some European sets of medals. They usually come in plush cases with little ribbons you pull to pull the medals out. But they're very inexpensive and very nice. But Metals have been a very part of my life, and although I don't own an 1804 dollar, and I don't own a, uh, 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 anyway, any of this 1913 nickel, all this sort of things we've handled, uh, I do ha ha have and have never sold any of my metals in my collection, and I love them today. I just became 80 years old, so I have to ask the kids if they want some of these and maybe sell them sometime, uh, because that's, that's, how, that's how metals uh, continue to be collectible, but uh, at the moment uh, I'm still a buyer and I plan to live to be 124 years old. Uh, buy that treasury bond. Yeah, uh, yeah he's a, wait, I'm, I'm not done yet. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, uh, his success was what I mentioned. It wasn't in selling pizza and it wasn't in starting an airline uh, across the Atlantic, but it was in securities, okay? And he, we were talking about investments today, the Standard Poor uh, Index and so forth. And he said, well, you know, because you're going to live so long, you should buy 30-year uh, no coupon or no, uh, uh, no sure. interest bonds. And, I, and so that was his investment advice. No, I, he didn't say, because you're so cheap. <coughs> you're so cheap. You'll, you have to live to see them mature and yeah. pay off at full value. But as, I, as I've said, uh, but Confucius said this earlier, I've never worked a day in my life because I love what I do. And I think you could probably ask anybody who's a professional to see Tony Chernova in the back there, for example, or David Sunman, or professionals, that they probably would echo that. You know, they're not saying, look, I'm looking forward to I'm 65 and can go fishing. They want to be around. So anyway, thank you for having me. Uh, that, that is my awe moment medal. I, I had bought it as part of a large collection. Uh, and I bought the collection because I was disagreeing with the owner over which metals were real and which weren't. And I figured rather than to wrestle on everything we looked at, uh, can I make an offer for the whole thing? And in there was this Anthony Wayne medal in bronze. That's one of the Commission Americana medals. Uh, it is the only example in bronze uh, known. And uh, I had no idea at the time, but it turned out to be that way, and it happens to be beautiful on top of it at all. So it's a pride and joy. Uh, could you click the next pride and joy? 
This is a uh, silver medal of Daniel Morgan. It's uh, uh, another great rarity. I think it's probably the only silver outside of uh, institutions. And uh, I just like it because I like Daniel Morgan. I, Washington was a great general, but I think perhaps the most able of all of the Revolutionary War officers uh, uh, was Morgan. I mean, he was a superhero. He was everywhere and um, a great contributor to the United States. So uh, the rest of my presentation, uh, I should announce that all of these presentations will be uh, <coughs> captured and published in the fourth quarter issue of the MCA advisory. So stay tuned and read all about it there. And uh, uh, thank you for your endurance. You're an incredible, they're, they're, they're ready for another hour. Have we got more program? Uh, stay here, stay here. I have 15 minutes to wrap up. I don't have 15 minutes of, of talking to wrap up. So I want to give 10 minutes of my time to questions from the audience for the, for the panel. So if we could put the microphone out there, Gavin. We have 10 oh. minutes of questions to our illustrious panel. I didn't, I'm sorry, Ann, I didn't mean to cut you off. I didn't know something about that. Okay, my question, um, my kids have no interest in my collection. And I'm wondering what happens to collectibles, baby boomers are gonna keep doing this, but what happens to the Gen Xs? Do you see? Gen X is liking this stuff? And will there be a demand for my collection 20 years from now or 30 years from now? I can address uh, that. I, I can not be my job if I didn't make my bid. Yeah, as a dealer, I've seen many instances uh, that someone gives coins to their kids that don't like them, so the kids would much rather have cash and go out and buy a Jaguar or something. My recommendation and, and not is to uh, see if the kids are interested, and if they are, give them or whatever you do. If they're not, sell them while you're alive and you can watch what's going on. One of my favorite stories is that a lady called me in, uh, in, in, uh, from New Orleans about uh, 15 years ago, and she said, I have a collection of, the, I think they're called double eagles, you know, and there are many dozens of different and everything. I inherited them from my husband. I don't know anything about coins. And uh, uh, would you auction them? I saw your ad in Coin World or however she heard of me. And I said, yes, we will. So uh, they said, what does that involve? Well, you know, we would have someone come there to pick them up. And it was very valuable. It had some proofs in it, too. A very valuable coin collection. And then we would uh, uh, take them home. We would uh, uh, catalog them, photograph them, and we'd make them available to uh, uh, get publicity. And then we'd held, held them, sell them in New York or Los Angeles or with a convention or something. And how long does this take? Well, you know, you're probably looking at least three months for a first class job. Didn't hear from her. Called back about two months later. What happened? He said, oh, well, you, I, I found someone in New Orleans as an auctioneer. He didn't have to write a catalog, and he sold them the Saturday after I talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never had any uh, doubt that my collection would go to an institution because I wanted to share it, and that was the best way to do it, which is what I did. It depends on the institution, of course. Why aren't there more women collectors? Remember that the mint directors are women, Ann and Anne, Anne Bentley is a woman, Uta Wartenberg in charge of the ANS is a woman, uh, Kim Kick in charge of the ANA is a woman, uh, the uh, uh, editors of Coin World for most of the years are two women, Margot Russell and Beth Deicher, so women certainly have been super accomplished. I would prob but uh, I'd probably say that women, uh, my wife Christy is uh, a collector of Chinese coins and medals. Uh, I, I would say that uh, women probably constitute, you know, David Summon, how many, what percentage of Littleton customers are women? No, but I, I would say the under 40%. Under what? Probably, probably under 40 percent, but I... That sounds high my, my marketers would know, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would give another answer, uh, Dave. I, I, I think, and this is something all of us probably don't like to recognize, but I do believe it's true, is that 
in every coin and metal collector, there is at least a little element of greed. Competitiveness? Greed and competitiveness. And, and, and I think those traits run stronger in males than females, hence the preponderance of the one sex in coin collecting. That's My not opinion. All, that's not all. Not all the hobby is attributable to greed or No, no, no. There must be more. I don't know if it's the attitudes on the men who dominate collecting or something else, or many things. May I have more questions? From the back? I have, Fire. Mic I have the microphone, so I have to tell you that um, yes, there are a lot of academics in this, but women don't collect. I think this is a, something that's changing with women having more money um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, I think I don't collect that much personally, but with my husband as well as some other people. And I have to say, John, I would completely challenge you on this. It's really a lack of resources for a lot of women, and women also are not quite as public. But for example, um, how many women are sitting in front here. You know, I think if women are given the opportunity and the money, they will be very active collectors, and I think we're seeing this more and more. Thank you. Remember Emery May Holden Norweb. So, hi, everybody. Um, it's off, but I, I think you can. So I think my question fits in nicely. I have a background in art history, but I'm not a collector or a very avid collector of metals or coins. What's the recommendation for someone at my age, my point in my life, where I have the money to enter the market and maybe I've studied a little bit or studied one piece in school and that's what's drawn me back to metals. Where do I take it? How do I get the entree? Where's the best place to start? I would start with good collections in museums um, because there you see really good examples and you get to sort of, you, you train your eye for what is of great quality. In terms of the market, then it depends on your budget, I guess, to some extent. Um, but the best, it, it is a, an area where comparative uh, work is, is really important so that you end up with the best example, and the same thing with Old Master Prince. I mean, you sort of do comparative work, and then you see uh, what you what you should have. Then it's a question of cost. I, I would <coughs> can, I would just add I completely agree with that, um, and and certainly others here would say you know just as you, you, we've all read by the book first. You know there are many good books that Len talked about. Uh, becoming a member of the MCA and reading the advisory would be another. But I, I would uh, add one other thing, um, which is to find oh, one a mentor or, or a group of mentors. It could be a dealer or it could be another collector. And particularly if you're already gravitating to one um, idea of specialization, whether it's school medals or Renaissance medals or so-called dollars or whatever, uh, see if you can find out who are the main collectors of those things and just, you know, make friends. Some of them won't want to hear from you. Others may, you know, someone may take you under their wing or at least advise you as certain things come up for sale or what books to read or who else to get to know, what meetings to go to. Um, you know, even just the connections of other people in this room are, are going to be invaluable to anyone who's starting to collect. In my little talk, I forgot to mention the 1838 New Haven Medal. There's a medal that uh, in 1838 was designed the 300th anniversary of New Haven. And uh, if you read the newspapers of the day uh, on the internet, uh, it was called the most wonderful medal made in America uh, before the Civil War. Uh, and, and it was uh, very highly praised. So I. Uh, did a lot of research on it, as did Neil, Neil Musante here. Uh, I told it to David Sunman, and uh, mentioned it to David Sunman, oh, I have to get one, but uh, I have, there are two varieties, and I think they cost me about six or seven hundred dollars each. They're, they're large, they're very rare, and one nice thing about metals, not, maybe not mentioned in the seminar here today, this is wonderfully organized, one of the most best organized things I've ever been, been to, thanks to a few people here. But, uh, the problem in getting a New Haven medal is not paying for it, it's finding it. And I think you could say the same for tokens and medals. 
uh, you can pay for most everything, maybe not, maybe not a, a George uh, Washington Indian Peace Medal or something, but you can pay for 99% pay for of the medals on the market, but uh, finding them is, is, it's going like going hunting or fishing. The, the, the uh, thrill of the chase is very much present and part of what we all like. Yeah, I would just say to get started, um, look up your local coin club. You go to your local coin club meetings. Then <coughs> if you can, go to a show. And by all means, come to summer seminar at the ANS. I, for one, would love to thank all of the participants today who came from afar and have shared their knowledge, their expertise, and their passion for medals. I have learned an awful lot. I hope you have also. I have to thank, before we go off to our reception, I have to thank a lot of people who made this happen. First, John Sally did all the heavy lifting before today. So, and he and I will be the first to tell you that without Gavin Cleesby's and his assistant, Sarah, this would not have happened. It would not have run smoothly, and we'd all be out in the street trying to find out where, where we needed to go. So, Gavin, I thank you very much. <laughs> Chris Coveney was our IT guy. He's the one that has taped the entire day so that the Mass Historical Society and metal collectors can eventually put these up online so that we can revisit the talks. And just as John will have them in, in print, we will have them on, with the slides on, on the internet. So thank you very much, Chris. And, um, and our dedicated library staff, several members of whom volunteered today to give up one of their three-day weekend days so that we could all participate in this fabulous conference. I thank you all for coming. And now, we get to go and have a wonderful Look, reception. Can I say one remark? Uh, for 18 years, I was a lecturer at Harvard University uh, on a class called Museology for would-be uh, museum curators. So about the last five years, uh, I had I had Ann Bentley, because I'm not a museum curator, come in, and she was my exhibit A. <laughs> so, so at the end, at my, uh, so toward the end of the thing, I said. Now, uh, do you have any questions? And then everybody asked questions of Anne. I said, well, I'm the one giving the program. Why are you all <laughs> talking to Anne? And wow. then the, the, uh, Dr. Carl Francis retired, and uh, the class has ended. But that was very memorable to have Anne part of it. Well, I thank you. It was a lot of fun. It's always fun to have students come and ask you questions. And that's what we do here. And so we are here. Uh, after today, we are here. You just, we're just an email away or a phone call away, and we always love questions. So, so please go ahead and do so. So unless you have anything to add, no, we are, we are done for the day. Let us go and have refreshment and wonderful conversation with all of these fabulous metal people. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>